In the second hour, we are going to continue with our study of the eighth basic doctrine according to the book of Hebrews. And in this case, it is the New Testament missionaries that we are focusing our attention on. And we are focusing on the third disciple, which is Peter. This is the 33rd increment. And the title of this sermon is the Magisterium. Magisterium. <clears throat> I have put on the uh, screen a diagram that uh, takes into account half of the first phase of Peter's career. And you can see a timeline with, uh, it's segmented into colors, the blue, the red, the green, and then finally the white. What we are going to be looking at is actually part of the blue section. And um, in the blue section, we have uh, Peter's mother-in-law that we have already uh, studied, Matthew chapter eight, verses 14 and following, and then also the great catch of fish, Luke chapter 5, and we spent a few weeks studying that. We have also spent some time looking at the call of Peter, his first call, second, third call, and the fourth call, which is the doctrine of apostleship. The fourth item on this list is when Peter walks on water, Matthew 14, verse 28. The fifth item is the question that Peter asks, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, uh, John 6, 68. The sixth item on this blue list is the words in which Peter makes his confession, Peter is blessed, and then Peter is rebuked. And uh, the confession is uh, initiated by uh, the Lord, uh, uh, or I shouldn't say initiated, but it is complemented by the Lord's quote of saying, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 23. That uh, will be the focus of our study this morning. The seventh item on the list, which we won't study today, is the rising uh, or the raising of Jairus's daughter. The eighth is Paul uh, Peter being a witness of the transfiguration, a point that we will see as an adjunct to number six. The ninth is the fish and the tribute money, Matthew chapter 17. And so number six is the item that we are going to be making the focus of our study for this week and for the next uh, few weeks. So let's uh, begin. We have looked at the text, which is Matthew 16, verses 13 through 23, and we'll look at it again um, today. We have also noted the district of Caesarea Philippi. Uh, this is Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. And then we come to the issue of Jesus's identity as hypostatic union. And this is the big doctrinal issue in this study. We have noted that he is not the political Messiah that people wanted. People desired that Jesus would be the political Messiah, the one who would deliver them from the uh, Roman oppressors. We also see that Jesus' physical appearance did not depict Jesus as king. He didn't have a royal uh, vestment. He didn't have a royal look about him. He was just a plain, normal man. But from observation of Jesus' miracles and teachings, uh, people, in particular Peter, was able to recognize that God the Father was using Jesus as to being the true Messiah. 
And so God the Father used this to reveal the truth to Peter. This particular point is what will lead us to the study of the magisterium. And of course I'm pronouncing the word in, with an English pronunciation magisterium so that the spelling of it will be easier to follow. The magisterium. The magisterium is pictured here on the screen as, uh, well, you can see, let me get my cursor to float up here. You have all these men here with the red caps and red sashes. They are men who are known as the cardinals of the Roman Catholic Church. Cardinal because of the color, cardinal because of the number. There are ordinal numbers and cardinal numbers. And uh, this is the uh, cardinal number, which means that they are like number ones. You will see that there are some other people involved here. They don't have the uh, red cap. Uh, they are sometimes the theologians, uh, the top notch, the cut above all the other theologians in the Roman Catholic Church. And then at the head of the table, way in the back, you have the individual in the white uh, dress or the white uh, suit, and that is the Pope. So, letter D, the magisterium. A definition. What is the magisterium? Definition. The term magisterium refers to the official teaching body of the Roman Catholic Church. This is the official teaching body of the Roman Catholic Church. Usually it's related to the large house of cardinals, the leading theologians in the movement, but finally all of that comes under the Pope himself. Besides providing a trusted and unified voice to guide Roman Catholics, this body also allows the church to make official pronouncements on contemporary issues which scripture might not directly address. Now there's a couple of things that I want to clarify uh, here in our definition. And first of all, in point uh, C, uh, besides providing a trusted, unified voice to guide Catholics. Now, the word Catholic is an old word, and it just simply means universal. So, we believe in the Catholic Church. That is one of our creeds, and that means that we believe in the universal church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means that if you believed in Christ as your personal Savior in the year 1800, that you are part of the universal church. If you believed in Christ, then you are in Timbuktu, and it's the year 2019, you are in the Catholic Church. If you are a believer in Everett, Washington, you are in the Catholic Church. But when you say Roman Catholic, now you are making your definition much more pointed, and you are referring to the church who has its center, its capital city, its capital church in the city of Rome. It's a separate city and separate entity altogether. Um, we call it the Vatican. And so within the Vatican, there is this special body known as the Magisterium. And this body allows the church to make official pronouncements on contemporary issues which scripture might not directly address. There is no equivalent to the magisterium in Protestantism. We have no pope. We don't have a unified body that sets down policy or creeds for ourselves. The fallacious support for the magisterium that is found in Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 
through 19. <clears throat> In the image which is on the screen, you are able to see, and I'll fold the cursor over the top, you have the Lord Jesus talking to Peter and giving Peter, you can see in the hand of Jesus, the keys. There's more than one key. These are the keys to the kingdom. Keys usually stand for the ultimate authority. And so this is where the magisterium comes in. Did Jesus give Peter the ultimate authority over the church? which he would in turn pass on to his successor, and he would pass on to his successor and his successor and his successor, along with all the powers that come with that key. That is what is going to be our study. The fallacious support. And so here is a quotation, Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 through 19. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Verse 18. Verse 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, that whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Verse 19, Matthew 16, 19. This is the passage of scripture that we need to analyze to come to correct doctrinal conclusions. This is the same passage of scripture that the Roman Catholic Church uses to falsely support its claims that Peter was the first pope and that the pope today has the same powers that Jesus had back uh, during his earthly ministry. As you can tell, the Pope is the head of a very large church. He is not only revered, but venerated by thousands upon millions of people throughout the world. When he makes his appearance, he makes his appearance as being the superstar of the church. There is no one who is higher. There is no one who outlasts him or who outdoes him. He is the leader of the Roman Catholic Church. And according to their dogma, he is God's vicar or Christ's vicar here on earth. <clears throat> Letter B. The Roman Catholic Church, that's what the RCC stands for, bases this belief on the flawed, and I might add false, interpretation of Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 through 19. It is the interpretation of these verses which constitutes one of the biggest distinctions between Protestants and Roman Catholics. So let me give you some of these distinctions as they quickly come to the surface. The first of these, the church requires a pope and Peter was the first one. Jesus said, I will build my church. You are Peter. So that makes him the first person. He is the foundation of the church. The church has been founded on him. So the church needs a foundation. The church needs a pope, and Peter was that pope. Number two. This is number two in, this, in the uh, minuscule Roman numeral. When the Bible does not directly address an issue, tradition, and you notice that tradition is in all caps, tradition is followed. So, if the Bible does not give or does not address an issue directly, then instead of looking to the scriptures, you look to the tradition that has been established by the Roman Catholic Church across the centuries, and that is what is to be followed. Tradition 
is set by the magisterium. So how do you tell what tradition is? You find out what the magisterium has to say. Roman numeral number three, minuscule. The Pope is given the extraordinary power of ex cathedra. This is sometimes referred to as a papal bull. This means that this is a decree that comes from the Vatican. Whenever the Pope speaks ex cathedra, his pronouncement is infallible. In other words, it has no error. It has no error. It has no possible misjudgment or miscalculation or any type of a flaw. It is just as powerful and just as good as the Bible itself. So when the scripture says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, the idea is, if you say this is the word of God, and you're there in Rome saying it, guess what? It immediately gets copied in the memory banks of heaven as the word of God. Also, if you happen to say, as was said of Martin Luther, he used to be saved, but now I take away his salvation. It's taken out of the memories in heaven and cast out. This is the power of the magisterium. Okay, so up until now, we have now seen the text of Scripture. We have commented about the district of Caesarea Philippi, how it was a tourist uh, uh, center uh, then in the ancient world still today. And we see that the issue of Jesus' identity as hypostatic union is the issue in this passage. And because of that, then we note that there is a context as far as Peter's confession, and that is, what is it that Peter said? There is a context to the blessing that Jesus gave Peter because of what Peter said, and then there's a rebuke because Peter didn't stop talking. He said something more. We are going to look at those things. Prologue. Matthew 16 has a prologue. Verses 1 through 12 give us that prologue. And we can look at these verses and we can uh, muse over them. But when we come to the end of the section, Jesus says to his disciples, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Would you open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. And um, let me read verse 5. And the disciples came to the other side of the sea, but they had forgotten uh, to bring any bread. And Jesus said to them, Watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They began to discuss this among themselves, saying, He said that because we did not bring any bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, you men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Did you not understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000? Or how many baskets full you picked up? Or the seven loaves of the 4,000? And how many large baskets full you picked up? How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Verse 12, then they understood that he did not say beware of the leaven of bread, 
but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So the first 12 verses give us the foundation for the context of what follows next. And that is that Peter, when uh, Jesus asked Peter, well, who do you say that I am? He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. This is a confession to the hypostatic union of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that it probably doesn't mean an awful lot to us because it is a seminary term. It's a term of theology. It probably, in your thinking, belongs on the shelves of some seminary somewhere. So the first part that we understand is this prologue. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And what leaven is that? It is their doctrine. It is the doctrine of these individuals. Even though they were antagonistic one toward the other, their teaching, their conflicting doctrines is leaven as far as the Lord is concerned. Let her be. So what was the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Well, the Lord Jesus identifies for them that the doctrine of the scribes and the Pharisees is leaven. It is evil. It is their teaching. Now he asks them, whom do men say that I am? So if you look uh, at our passage of scripture, we come to verse 13. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so here is this conversation. Whom do you say that I am? At this time, when preachers are going through this passage of Scripture and teaching their congregation about it, they'll often ask the question, what about you? Who do you say that Jesus is? Is he just the baker who can make uh, bread out of stones? Is he the miracle worker who will put your marriage back together, who will give you prosperity in your business? Is he the healer who will take care of your disease? Who is he to you? So it's a question that can be asked generally. But in our case, we want to see the academic value of this because this is what he is asking his disciples. So is this a strange question? And so let me ask you some other questions. And uh, you don't have to answer out loud, but you can answer inside your head. Where was the Declaration of Independence signed? Okay, you got your answer at the bottom of the page. <laughs> Question number two. What is the main reason for divorce? Answer, marriage. Question number three. What can you never eat for breakfast? Lunch. Half right. <laughs> Lunch and dinner. Unless, of course, you go to uh, IHOP or Denny's where they always serve breakfast. Question number four. If you throw a red stone into the blue sea, what will it become? A wet stone. A uh, wet very good. You guys are catching on here. How can a man go eight days without sleeping? He sleeps at night. These are trick questions. So is Jesus' question to his disciples, is that a question which is a trick question? Let me ask you some more. If you had three apples and four oranges in one hand and four apples and three oranges in the other hand, what would you have? 
a very <laughs> large pair of hands. <laughs> Question number seven. If it took eight men 10 hours to build a wall, how long would it take four men to build it? No time at all. The wall's already built. Number eight. How can you drop a raw egg onto a concrete floor without cracking it? This, you know, makes you probe every philosophical corner in your mind. Answer, any way you want. Concrete floors are very hard to crack. <laughs> Number nine. What's the main reason for failure? Okay, exams. Okay, so these are trick questions. So we have to ask ourselves a question. Was Jesus trying to trick his disciples? I mean, it's easy for us. Who am I? Who am I to you? All right, so up until now, we have come to the context of Peter's confession, his blessing, and his rebuke. We've taken a look at the prologue, Beware of the Leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And we have asked the question, Whom do men say that I am? And we have asked all the trick questions that we can think of. Now, how about the strange answers? Because we know that there are strange questions. What about strange answers? Well, strange answers. Verse 14 begins by saying, And they said, if you look at Matthew 16, 14, And they said, the actual meaning is, And they answered. Number one, some say, John the Baptist, in other words, the herald of the Messiah. This is Matthew eleven seventeen, 17, Mark 16, verses 14 through 28. We'll maybe look at this in a little bit of detail. Would you open your Bibles to Matthew 11, a few pages to the left, and we'll look at verse 17. And I'll only read the verse so that we won't get uh, enmeshed in the quicksand of the context. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist! Exclamation point. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Verse, verse 11. Jump now all the way down to uh, verse, um, am I in the right passage? Okay, verse 13. <clears throat> For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, that's John the Baptist, and if you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. Look at verse 14 and look what Jesus says about John the Baptist. He says, if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who was to come. Now this is an incredible statement on the part of our Lord Jesus. Would you now go to Mark chapter 6, please? And I want to begin to read at verse 14, but I'll start at verse 13 so that we get a little bit of uh, the context. And they were casting out demons and were anointing uh, with oil many sick people and healing them. Verse 14. And King Herod heard of it, for his name became well known, and people were saying, John the Baptist has risen from the dead, and that is why these miraculous powers are working in him. So we see that uh, 
some people were saying about Jesus that he was John the Baptist who had come back from the dead. Others were saying it is Elijah, and others were saying he is a prophet, like the one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he kept saying, John, whom I beheaded, has risen. For Herod himself had sent and had John arrested, bound in prison, an account of Herodias, his wife, of his brother Philip, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death and could not do so. For Herod was afraid of John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe, that is, bound in prison. And when he heard him, he was very perplexed, very perplexed but he used to enjoy listening to him. A strategic, a strategic day came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his lords and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. And when the daughter, daughter of Herodias herself came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you want, and I will give it to you. And she swore, and he swore to her, Whatever you ask of me, I will give it you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. So here is the picture that Herod had had John the Baptist beheaded, but now because Jesus was performing these miracles, the rumor was John the Baptist is back from the dead. So some say that John the Baptist, in other words, he's the herald of the Messiah. Well, let me finish reading up to verse 28. Immediately she came in a hurry to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me the head uh, of John the Baptist on a platter. And although the king was very sorry, yet because of his oaths and because of his dinner guest, he was unwilling to refuse her. Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded him to bring back his head, and he went and had him beheaded in the prison, and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. So this, there is no doubt. John the Baptist is dead. But the, the rumor was, the speculation was that Jesus was back on earth, or that Jesus was John the Baptist back from the dead. The second answer is some think it's Elijah because Elijah has come back. Now, there are some um, there are some instances or there are some circumstances here about Elijah. And uh, let me uh, just have you turn in your Bibles to Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6. So we're looking at the last book of the Old Testament, the last chapter. Verse 5 says, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. And this, these two verses comprise a future condition that will take place at the outset of the millennial kingdom. John the Baptist, or shall we say Elijah, which is mentioned here in verse 5, is going to come and he is going to restore, shall we say, spiritual order so that all the people who enter into the millennium, that is, who walk into the millennium, these are live people, not people in resurrection, but live people will have the same faith as the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all those in the Old Testament who have believed in Christ, so that only 
regenerate Jews walk into the millennial kingdom. And who is going to make sure that that happens? Elijah. So there were some people who said, this is Elijah. Well, is this a credible thing or is it not? Would you now turn your Bibles to Matthew 17? And we're going to get into this passage as well later on, but uh, we will get into this passage as well. This is the, the uh, scene of the Transfiguration. Remember, they're in Caesarea Philippi, this tourist center. And there they are in a place away from the city, but uh, in that area, a very pleasant area to be in. And uh, Jesus... Uh, took uh, James and John and Peter to a peak uh, or to a, the top of a ridge, and there he was transfigured in front of them. And so as... Well, let me read verse 2. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. So here we have the mention of Elijah, and that Elijah was there. Jump all the way down to verse uh, 9. And as they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. And the disciples asked him, why then do the disciples say that Elijah must come first? And so now we are opening ourselves up to this particular um, doctrinal issue about Elijah. And he answered and he said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. Remember, we just read that from Malachi. But I say to you that Elijah already came. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So what did they do? They cut off his head. See, They did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. So we see we're entering in this very difficult place. So some say that it's Elijah. Others say it's Jeremiah or one of the prophets. All three, or if you want to take four, if you want to count Jeremiah or one of the prophets, count four entities. Mentioned here are people that at that time they believed were coming back from the dead. So here is a question. Does anybody come back from the dead? Now, in those days, there used to be, and there is still that uh, particular theory, that your soul, when you die, gets floated up to, to heaven or someplace, and then God assigns it to a different body. It's called the transmigration of the soul. So, they basically thought, yes, John the Baptist's head was cut off, and that was the soul of Elijah. And the soul of Elijah is going to come back one more time when Jesus is there, and then one more time at the beginning of the tribulation. So this is a... Um, an issue that we want to explore and we will do so in the coming weeks. Now before we go there, I want to close with this picture. The picture that is on the screen is the picture of some people that are gathered together for what is known as the setter. This is the observance of the Passover supper. Now, usually this is done by Jews, but on occasion, and it's beginning to become more and more frequent, Christians observe the Passover and the Passover supper. And um, one of the things that has been brought down across the centuries 
is that when you sit at the table, you set the table, you always set a place for Elijah. And in this photograph that you see on the screen, there is an empty chair because guess who's coming to dinner? It's Elijah. So this is where we will begin uh, next time. Let's stand to be dismissed with a word of prayer. And shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we are able to look into the scripture. And despite the fact that we look at things which sometimes are uh, complicated, that you have given to us the Holy Spirit who will give us the correct rendering of your word so that we can honor our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you have allotted to us this time to be together. We thank you for this time in Christ's name. Amen.